A cursory search online will tell you surviving on a desert island is pretty simple. Eat fish and drink coconut water. This will work for a few days, a couple weeks, maybe even a month, but after that you can expect to die a creeping, painful death from nutrient deficiency. So this video will teach you how to survive, not for a day, not for a week, and not for a month, but indefinitely, as long as possible. And surviving on a desert island isn't easy, but I think you will be surprised by just how doable it is. Before I get into all that though, there's one thing we should talk about first. Sources. On the very, very, very outside chance that you ever need to use this information, would be an absolute life or death situation. So it's important that you, the viewer, feels a sense of trust in what is being presented. The primary source used for this video is the SAS Survival Handbook. Among the survivalist community, this book is basically the gold standard. It can teach you how to survive anything from jungle voyages to airplane disasters, all the way to car crashes and a whole lot more. It's a book that could, in a myriad of situations, save your life. The book was written by John Lofty Wiseman. He is an impressive person, to say the least. At the age of 18, Lofty became the youngest person ever to pass the selection exam for the British SAS, or Special Air Service. He served in this elite and very confidential Special Forces unit for 26 years. The SAS has a huge remit of responsibilities, including counterterrorism, hostage recovery, and covert reconnaissance. Basically, the SAS is very akin to the American Special Forces unit, the Navy SEALs. In the interest of transparency, I should say that despite its clever title, the SAS Survival Handbook is not an official SAS document, but it is assembled from techniques and tutorials and information taught by the organization. One of the fatal flaws of this video is that all desert islands are different. A desert island could look like this, 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 or this. Obviously, each of these environments will require a hugely different approach as far as survival goes. So, we're kind of just forced to pick one and make a video about it. We need to define our desert island. So, in this video, we're going with the classic tropical desert island. It is the desert island that everyone pictures in their head. It's the one that comes up when you search desert island. These islands are found in the South Pacific or the Caribbean, and either location will have a tropical rainforest climate. This means it will be very hot, humid, and wet. Expect temperatures of 70 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Places with this climate have about 2.4 inches of rain per month year round. There is no dry season. Our island will also be small, small enough that you could cover most of it on foot in a reasonable amount of time. Think of hours or days, not weeks. It will have sandy beaches and again a lush interior forest as most of these islands do. Now, depending on how you got to the island, you could have any number of items to help you survive. If you had crash-landed in a plane or been shipwrecked, you could use the fragments of these vessels to your advantage. You could build a shelter from the wreckage. Many of these boats or planes also have survival packs on board or even radios that could be engineered to function. But you will have none of these things. Instead, we will assume that you just woke up on the island with nothing but the clothes on your back and the shoes on your feet. The ocean is also unfortunately full of trash. It is likely that some of these items could be found and used to help you survive. However, I will not give you advice based entirely on the hope that you find a plastic bag, a bottle, or any other item. There is a significant chance that you could find these, but a video covering every trash-based contingency would be infinitely long. Further, survival advice that requires fate bestowing you with some crucial implement is pretty much useless if you are not so lucky. So, you've got nothing. You also have no idea where the nearest mainland is, what direction it's in, or if any shipping routes are nearby. Broadly speaking, you will have no reason to believe rescue is imminent, likely, or even really possible. We want to create a worst case scenario for this survival guide. Now. With all of that out of the way, here we go. So, you've just woken up on the desert island. There are some things you need to remember about any type of survival situation. This one, very much included. First, the mental game. It would be incredibly easy to collapse on the white sand and just become overwhelmed with despair. 
but with this kind of attitude your situation is only going to worsen. To survive on this island you need to have self-belief. You then need to harness that self-belief into positive actions that will ensure your survival. Positive action is the only way you will survive. So remain calm. Think logically, not emotionally. Mental distress does use up calories and you need to save calories. Panicking also can negatively affect the decision-making process. Just remaining calm and being prepared puts you on the right track. Because the fact is a healthy, well-nourished adult body can go through a lot before it begins to break down. And indeed, physical fitness will be a big help in surviving on your desert island. To some extent, the fitter you are, the better your chances of survival become. Procuring important resources like water, food, and shelter will take a lot of energy and sometimes a lot of strength. You may need to hike, climb, or walk long distances over difficult terrain. It's important that you are able to perform these tasks in the first place, and it is equally important to rest while you are doing them. Do not overexert yourself. Take breaks often. Perhaps above all else, you should do everything in your power to avoid injury. An untreated or unbandaged laceration could get infected, meaning a slow and painful death. Broken limb would make it virtually impossible to get the items you need to survive. Ignoring even a single sore or blister could spell disaster down the line. Assess the danger of every move you take. Always keep an eye out for venomous insects and reptiles. There are plenty in jungled environments. When walking in the ocean, shuffle your feet to avoid sea urchins and stingrays. If you need to climb to gain access to resources, be absolutely certain there are none more readily available. Because there very well could be. Surprisingly, a desert island is a resource-rich environment. Coastlines are teeming with food sources. Coconut trees, fish, seals, seaweeds, mollusks, and more offer pretty much immediate nourishment. With that said, however, you will want to stay away from the beach unless you absolutely need to be there. The beach is full of sand flies, which carry diseases and bite. If you pick up some kind of disease from one of these bugs, it's pretty much game over. Without the protection of a jungle canopy, the sun is also at its hottest and brightest on the beach. Sun poisoning can cause symptoms like lesions, open blisters, fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, and more. These symptoms also cause dehydration, which is the last thing you need. So really, you want to avoid the sun as much as possible. The storm could also cause serious tidal changes to the coastline. You don't want to build shelter somewhere that can just get washed away. Instead, head towards the tree line. There you'll have some immediate respite from the sun and you can begin the search for your most valued resource. You can survive for about three days without water, less in very hot conditions. From processing waste to tiny nerve impulses, your body relies on water for everything. Indeed, every single cell in your body needs water to function. But the average person loses four to six pints of water per day just through normal activity. Even lying down, resting in the shade, and doing nothing but breathing, you will lose about two pints of water per day. As your work rate increases, so does your water loss. And to survive on this island, you'll need to be working quite a bit. There's no hardline formula for how much water you need to drink to survive. Every body is different. You can survive by drinking less water than you are losing per day, but only for a finite amount of time. Until you find your source of water, we'll get to that in a second, there are some important steps you should take to limit your body's water loss. Avoid overexertion. Do not smoke. Do not drink alcohol. Avoid the sun and keep as cool as possible. Do not lie on hot ground. Don't eat or eat as little as possible. When you eat and your body is dehydrated, fluids are taken from the vital organs to help digest that food. Don't talk. Breathe through your nose, not your mouth. So where do you find water? Well, on a tropical island, you have a lot of options. Sidebar, as you look for water, you should also take inventory of the island and what it has to offer. You should always be aware of your surroundings and know what resources are available for later use. So back to water. The easiest way is to dig. Find the high water line on the island. This is usually where the slope of the beach stops and the ground more or less levels out. 
Beneath the surface, you may find about two inches of water. This is rainwater or natural moisture that filters down through the sand. It could probably be brackish, half salt and half fresh, but it is still drinkable. Not ideal and it shouldn't really be your first choice, but it is simple and it is drinkable. You can also just wait until it rains, which in this climate it almost definitely will. Use some large leaves or pieces of tree bark to collect as much rainwater as you can. Despite pollution and general uncleanliness of rainwater, it is generally safe to drink almost anywhere in the world. However, you don't really know if it's going to rain within three days before you die. Tropical islands will also be very humid, so you can expect a lot of dew. You can use your clothing to soak up dew that accumulates overnight, then wring this dew out and drink it. One easy way to do this is by tying your clothes around your ankles and walking through dew-heavy foliage. Your clothes will be soaked and that will give you a substantial amount of water to wring out and drink. Most tropical islands will have coconut palms on them. Ripe coconuts will fall from the tree and are full of coconut milk, which is about half water. You'll need to find a rock to remove the outer husk of the coconut. Inside the husk you will find the nut of the coconut. To extract the coconut milk, pierce one of the darkened eyes of the coconut. This will be a great source of hydration during your time on the island. Large coconut can hold almost a quart of coconut milk. Do not drink from very young or very old coconuts. These will give you diarrhea, which dehydrates your body. Further, you should try to avoid relying solely on coconut milk as your source of water. It is a diuretic, so it makes you poop, which means you lose more fluid. Over time, you could lose more than you're getting from the coconut. If you need to climb a palm to get the coconut, first off, try not to. This should be avoided at almost all costs, so be very careful. Only do this if it is an absolute last resort and there is no other water on the island. A fall could mean a broken leg or two, which would be a huge and probably fatal problem. Do not try to climb a coconut palm like a rope. You want to use your feet to shimmy up the trunk, not your hands and arms. Tie your shirt around your ankles as a brace. This will help you put all your weight on your feet as you climb without slipping around the trunk. Shimmy up the tree doing all of the work with your feet. This is not easy and it will take a lot of practice. So go very slow until you are confident you can absolutely, positively climb the tree without falling. You can also tap coconut palms for a drinkable sap. Simply break off one of the harvesting branches and you'll get a slow stream of sweet sap for about 12 hours. After that, cut the stalk further and the sap will start flowing again. It is possible, although unlikely, that you'll find a sitting pool of water in the island's interior. Look carefully for signs of contamination around the water, like animal carcasses or unhealthy vegetation. If you see any of these, do not drink the water. But if it looks safe, boil the water prior to drinking. You can also look for cup-shaped plants that act as natural water collectors. Find leaves that are shaped like this or this to find small reservoirs of water. If you find one of these, a traveler's palm, you're in luck. Each one can hold up to two liters of water at the base of its stalks. Unless you have distilled your urine, do not drink it. The same goes for seawater. And in this scenario, creating a still is just not a realistic idea. It requires a lot of materials, and remember, you don't have any. Distillation is done with fire as well, and requires huge amounts of constant fuel for the fire, only to create a pretty small amount of water. Realistically, you have numerous better ways to find water. Indeed, there are clearly a lot of ways to get water on your island, but it's important that you don't rely too much on one source. Your island has limited resources. So the best idea would be to mix any of the above options and strictly ration your water. So whether you're drinking coconuts, collecting rain, or all of the above, you're set on water. That's a big deal. But now it's time to find some source of food. And just like with water, you've got plenty of options. But first you'll have to understand what your body needs to survive, because not all food is equal. A healthy body can survive for a while just by using stored energy in the tissues, about three weeks before you start to die of starvation. 
but after a while it will be increasingly difficult to keep warm, recover after hard work, expend any effort, or fight off disease. Further, a good meal is an excellent morale booster. In a survival situation, morale is tremendously important. If you are otherwise taken care of, it is worth spending the extra effort to make a meal that tastes good and is well cooked. Now, every body is going to be different, but in a purely restful state, the average person requires 70 calories per hour to maintain a basic metabolism. This, quote, basic metabolism covers only the involuntary activities that our bodies perform. Breathing, heart beating, blood circulation, etc. However, the most basic tasks like walking, standing up, and just moving require an additional 45 calories per hour. This brings us to a total of about 2,040 calories per day, without any major physical activity. Of course, depending on your body, there will be give or take with that number. On your desert island, you will probably be doing a lot of physical activity. The warm weather and hot sun will also use up additional calories. Your daily caloric needs could reach up to 3,000 or higher. Any mental effort or distress will also use up calories. Combine this with the fact that most of what you'll probably be eating, seafood, is pretty low calorie, and you've got a bit of a problem on your hands. So you'll need to eat a lot of food, especially at the beginning as you're traveling the island and looking for resources. Trapped on this island, it's easy to say you could just eat fish and survive forever. This is not true. You will eventually die of nutrient deficiency not supplied by the fish you are eating. Fish are really good for you, but your diet must be comprised of a wide range of nutrients and food types to keep your body going. These nutrients include proteins, carbohydrates, fats, minerals, and other trace elements and vitamins. Carbs make up the bulk of your diet as a human. They are your main source of energy for both physical effort and your body's important internal functions. Carbohydrates are naturally synthesized by and found in plants. Carbs are easily converted into energy and it does not require a lot of water intake to do so. Carbs prevent your body from going into ketosis. Ketosis is essentially a form of starvation in which your body aggressively burns fat. Intense periods of ketosis can result in indigestion, vomiting, and nausea. You've probably heard of the keto diet, which strives to keep your body in a state of ketosis. With this diet, you lose weight very quickly because it essentially triggers a starvation response. For our purposes, there are two types of carbohydrates, sugars and starches. Sugars are found in sugar, syrup, honey, treacle, and fruits. Starches are found in cereals, roots, and vegetables. Most of these items can probably be found on your island. Fats are a highly concentrated source of energy, but your body requires significant amounts of water intake to absorb them. It's a lot of work. The more fat you eat, the more water you need to drink. Fats are important because they heat and insulate the body, protect organs, and build your energy reserve. Fats are found in animals, fish, eggs, milk, nuts, even some vegetables. Proteins are the building blocks for living matter. They are the only nutrient containing nitrogen, and they are essential for your body's growth, recovery, and repair. If carbs and fats are missing from your diet, your body will eat away at its protein for energy. When this happens, you are starving. Sources of protein include meat, fish, eggs, dairy, nuts, some grains, and insects. The human body also requires many different minerals to function, most of which can be found in plant sources. These minerals enable vital body function, so it's critical that you eat plant life while stranded on your island. There are about a dozen vitamins that are also required by human beings. Vitamins D and K can be synthesized by the body, but the rest need to be ingested from external sources. Your body has roughly a 28-day supply of vitamins at all times. Vitamin C is the first that will need to be replenished. It is found in citrus fruits, leafy greens, roots, herbs, and other plants. Without vitamin C, you will get scurvy. Symptoms of scurvy include fatigue, inflammation of the gums, red or purple spotting on the skin, joint pain, and poor wound healing. It may be hard to find vitamin C on your island, so try to eat as many different fruits as you can. Your body's vitamin A will also be exhausted pretty quickly. 
Without vitamin A, your eyes will begin to lose function. Leafy greens and fish oils are rich in vitamin A, both of which will be prevalent on your island. By consuming a varied diet of animal proteins, plants, and fruits, you can pretty easily get most of the vitamins that your body is going to need. The most obvious food source is going to be seafood. All around you, the shore will be teeming with a huge variety of species that you can catch and eat for a tasty dinner. But you'll need to know which ones you should eat, which ones you shouldn't, and how to catch them. There are many species of coastal worms and small mollusks that bury right below the sand at the seashore. To find these, wait until the tide recedes, then look along the sand for small holes that indicate a buried creature. Dig where these holes are, and boom, there's dinner. Similarly, look near rock formations for mussels and oysters. These can be bashed or pried open with a stone. A mussel should close tightly when tapped, or it is dead. Do not eat dead mussels. In this tropical climate, mussels can also be very poisonous during the summer months, so avoid them if you're stranded in the summer. Mussels and oysters will be tightly attached to the rocks, so use a small stone to pry them off. If they are very easy to pry off without the use of an implement, they're probably dead and again should not be eaten. Keep an eye out for auger or turret shells. The animals in these can sting. They will not kill you, but they do hurt. You'll need to cook all of these food sources, and to do that you'll need fire, which we'll talk about in a bit. The vast, vast majority of fish are safe to eat. To be safe, avoid any fish that looks like it has spines or barbs. These are very common in shallow waters. They often hide in the sand and are so well camouflaged that they can be virtually undetectable. So when wading through the water, use a stick to clear the area immediately in front of your feet. Recognize and avoid the stonefish. This is the most venomous fish in the world and can be very well camouflaged in the sand. They're virtually indistinguishable from coral. Unfortunately, they are also native to tropical islands in the South Pacific, just like the one you're stranded on. Zebrafish are also very poisonous if eaten, but at 2.5 centimeters long, you should really be looking towards larger species for sustenance. Octopuses are also a good source of food. They are large and nutritious, though their meat can be a bit tough and will need to be cooked for several hours. If you see a hole in the ground or a crevasse in a rock formation that is surrounded by empty shells, there's probably an octopus living inside of it. These can be caught with a spear or a baited hook. Any octopus is going to have a beaked mouth. Some of these can give venomous bites, so it's important to avoid it while the octopus is alive. Watch out for the Australian blue ringed octopus. It is the most deadly octopus alive. If it bites you, you will die, and the species is frequently found in shallow water and tide pools. Avoid fishing as the tide is rising. You will be constantly retreating and getting your shoes wet, salt water, rots, boots, and fabric. Of course, to do any fishing, you'll need some implements, and we'll discuss those later in this video. Echinoderms are a family of animals including starfish, sea cucumbers, and sea urchins. Starfish are basically useless food-wise. Sea cucumbers and sea urchins are good food sources, though. They require very little energy to harvest and provide a reasonable amount of nutrition. Sea cucumbers wiggle along the sand bed or sometimes hide out near rocks and reefs. They basically look like cucumbers. These should be boiled or cooked for 5 to 10 minutes before eating, depending on the size of the specimen. Sea urchins look like prickly balls that cling onto rocks. Being careful to avoid the spines, split open the urchin and eat the golden yellow eggs on the inside. These can be eaten raw or boiled. The spines of the urchin should be moving when it is harvested. Do not eat any urchins that are perfectly still or smell rotten when opened. Crabs, shrimp, crayfish, prawns, and even lobsters are known to hang out in tidal zones near coastlines. However, you will need a net or a trap to have any hope of catching these fast-moving creatures. If you can make a net or a trap and you're able to catch them, crustaceans should be eaten as quickly as possible and boiled or roasted for 15 minutes. They often have parasites that can be hazardous to humans and cooking will kill these. 
Crabs also have lungs that are poisonous if ingested by humans. These are located just under the shell on either side of the body. If you are lucky enough to be visited by sea turtles, they are a great source of food. Though this type of meat spoils quickly. If you do catch and kill a sea turtle, eat what you can and quickly dispose of the rest. You do not want rotting flesh near your shelter. Sea turtle eggs are also a great source of nutrition if you find any. You can catch seabirds much in the same way you would fish. Bait a hook and place it on a rock or anywhere near a place you see birds frequent. When a bird eats the bait, yank on the line to plant the hook in the bird's mouth or throat. For more passive fishing, you can tie the opposite end of the line to a large rock. As the bird tries to take off, the weight from the rock may lodge the hook in the bird. Also keep an eye out for ground nesting birds. They will provide a good easy source of eggs. Do not risk climbing to retrieve any bird's eggs. Plants are where you will get essential vitamins, minerals, and carbs. Do not skip plants in your diet. You will die. There are thousands of plant species that could be found on your desert island depending on exactly where it is, so it's impossible for this video to cover them all. There is, though, a standard procedure that you can use for testing if a plant is edible. Do not take shortcuts. Do not skip any parts of this procedure. It is suggested that you prioritize plants last in your diet because this method of testing requires long periods of time without eating anything else. First, inspect the plant. If it has been eaten by worms or grubs, avoid it. Chances are its nutritional value has already been consumed. Do not eat any plants that are slimy or obviously dead. Second, smell the plant. If it smells like almonds, pears, or peaches, discard it immediately. These are all signs that cyanide is naturally present in the plant. Next, lightly rub or squeeze some of the plant's juice onto a fleshy part of your body on your forearm or your tricep, for example. Wait eight hours. If you experience any discomfort or redness, discard the plant immediately. Once you've done that, tear off a small piece of the plant. After each of the following stages, wait five to 10 minutes to ensure there is no negative reaction, and then proceed to the next stage. Place a small portion on the lips. Place a small portion in the corner of the mouth. Place a small portion on the tip of the tongue. Place a small portion under the tongue. Chew a small portion. If you feel no discomfort after any of these, you can swallow a small piece of the plant. Then wait five hours. During this time, do not eat or drink anything else. If you experience no unpleasant reactions, then the plant is probably safe to eat. Being in the tropics, you will likely find fruit-bearing trees. Try to only eat fruits from larger plants if possible. If you recognize any fruits, as you likely will on a tropical island, eat those first. Chances are you will find mangoes, papayas, starfruit, guavas, and more. Eat only brightly colored berries. Avoid hard, greenish berries. Peel any fruit you find. In the tropics, many fruits have thick skins that are bitter and difficult to digest. Test unrecognized fruits and berries the same way you would test plants. Shelter is extremely important on your desert island. You're in a hot, rainy climate, so you will need protection from the elements. Additionally, without proper rest and sleep, your body simply can't function. The better your shelter is, the easier it will be to rest, and thus, the easier it will be to survive. There are good and bad places to make a shelter. First, you want to avoid the lowest ground on the island. While your island is probably pretty flat, it does rain a lot. This rain will collect in lower lying areas and flood any shelter. Conversely, it is a good idea to avoid the highest sitting ground. This could overexpose you to the elements or any animals that could be lurking on the island. Put your shelter close to your primary water source, unless that water source is a river or sitting pool. These often harbor insects. The sound of running water could also make it difficult to hear any potential threats in the night. Do not make shelter on the beach. You will be far too exposed to the elements including sun, tidal changes, and storms. 
Your shelter should be near a plentiful supply of wood, but make sure there are no large, rotting, or dead trees near your chosen spot. In a storm, these will be the first to fall, and you don't want them collapsing onto your shelter. Avoid tall, solitary trees as they attract lightning, and you are in a stormy climate. Once you've chosen a spot for your shelter, double check for any animal tracks, wasp, or bee nests. Obviously, avoid building your shelter near these hazards. There are a lot of different types of shelter, all of which require different resources to construct effectively. But you are on a tropical island, so we will focus on a shelter that you can make with plants you certainly have in abundance. Bamboo is going to be your best friend in building the core structures of your shelter. Think floor and support beams. One of the easiest types of shelter to build is a lean-to shelter. These are simple to construct for beginners and can provide great protection from even the heaviest rain. A lean-to shelter is an extremely simple structure. It features a strong piece of wood placed across two tree branches. Long pieces of bamboo are then leaned to this horizontal beam to create an angled roof frame. Palm fronds are layered onto the roof to seal out water. The final piece is a floor, which you will need. The floor can be made from a layer or two of smashed bamboo. By smashing the bamboo, it will be flatter, more pliable, and thus more comfortable. The ground, no matter where you make your shelter, will be damp. It will be crawling with insects, leeches, and who knows what else. So your shelter needs to elevate you from the ground, even if by just a couple inches. Be very careful when splitting or harvesting bamboo and palm leaves. They can create sharp edges and fragments, and the last thing you need is an infection-prone open wound. With that said, you now have a shelter. This shelter will provide robust protection, but it may not last forever. You can periodically re-roof, re-floor, or otherwise rebuild your shelter as needed. Skilled builders can expand these into significantly more luxurious dwellings with the right practice. Food, water, and shelter are super important in the immediate term. But to survive for a prolonged period of time on your island, you will almost certainly need fire. Fire allows you to cook food, sterilize water, and importantly, send smoke signals for a potential rescue. With no other supplies, you'll need to make fire out of friction. This is not easy to do. It will require practice and determination. A fire bow is one way to make fire. Firebow uses a wood spindle to create tinder and friction on a hardwood base. As you rotate the spindle, it creates wood dust, or tinder, that is eventually ignited by the friction and heat from the base. Bamboo will work well for your spindle, but you will need something much harder for your base. Cut a small divot at the end of your baseboard and a cavity below it for your tinder. The spindle should be shaped as evenly as possible. Your bow can be made from bamboo, and your string can either be palm cordage or a strip of fabric from your clothing. A small stone can make it easier to exert the proper force on the top of the spindle. Use one hand to move the bow back and forth, and the other to press on the spindle. You can also use your foot to keep the baseboard in place. Increase the speed of the spindle as it drills through the baseboard. Eventually, it will create smoke, and then the tip of the spindle will begin to glow like a cigarette. Shortly after, it will ignite the tinder. Make sure you have more tinder nearby to keep the flame lit. This is an extremely difficult way to make fire, and it's just going to take a lot of practice. Some people will prefer a fire plow, as it is slightly simpler to create. Cut a straight groove in a baseboard, and then push the top of a soft wood shaft forwards and backwards. This will create tinder shavings and eventually light them. To light and maintain any fire, you will need three things. Tinder, kindling, and fuel. Tinder is anything that ignites with minimal heat, like the wood shavings created by your fire starting implement. The best tinder requires only a spark to catch fire. Wood shavings, dried grass, dried mushrooms, bird plumage, and bird nests all make really good tinder. As you walk around your island, keep a constant eye out for tinder. It should be completely dry and this will be hard to find on a small island. 
Kindling is the wood that brings more fire from tinder, allowing you to then burn much larger, longer lasting sources of fuel. Small dry wigs are ideal kindling. Kindling burns very fast, so make sure your fire's main fuel is nearby when you start using kindling. Fuel is the larger pieces of wood that you will burn. As a rule, the heavier the piece of wood is, the more heat it will provide. Mix dried old wood and fresh green wood for a long lasting fire. Do not burn bamboo. It is very useful for other purposes and burns very quickly. Damp wood can be advantageous. It does not burn well, but produces a lot of smoke, which wards off insects. So once your bundle of tinder has ignited, add kindling on top of it in a rectangular shape. Once your kindling is burning consistently, slowly add fuel to maintain your fire in this same rectangular shape. Think Lincoln Logs. At this stage, a fire will be easy to sustain as long as it is given fuel. Food is a precious resource, and you cannot afford to waste any of it learning to cook. You don't need to be a Michelin-starred chef to survive on a desert island, but you do need to understand basic food prep and cookery. When it comes to preparing a fish, you will need to scrape off the scales. These are not edible. Use a sharp rock to do this by making sweeping motions from the fish's tail to its head. The scales will come off pretty easily. Then make a long lateral cut on the fish's belly. Pull out the fish's internal organs and you're ready to cook. Virtually all fish can be eaten whole, though you will need to pick out the bones. As a general rule, the longer you cook vegetables and plants, the softer they become. So if an edible plant is too difficult to chew, boil or cook it. You should always cook over low flame. This will ensure that you do not burn your food and it will help to conserve fuel for your fires. Never leave food unattended while it cooks. In a survival situation, you do not have the luxury of burning or ruining your food. Boiling will be the best way to keep your food as nutrient dense as possible, assuming you drink the water after cooking. This is because the nutrients and fat, if cooking meat, will melt into the water. However, you will obviously need a lot of water and using ocean water is not ideal. As water boils, it gets saltier because the fresh water is evaporated and the salt is left behind. That salt can then leach into your vegetables during the cooking process. Salt is a necessary nutrient, but you don't want to have too much of it. To boil water, you will need a vessel. You can boil water in a wide, hollow piece of bamboo set slightly above your fire, like this. Roasting is a great way to cook protein like the fish that you will be catching. To do this, skewer the fish on a bamboo or wooden spit and mount it over your fire. Continuously turn the fish until it is thoroughly cooked. If your fire is too hot, the outside of the fish will be burnt while the inside will remain undercooked or entirely raw. Grilling is a popular outdoor cooking method, but it requires some kind of flat surface to use as your grill. A large rock could work, but it would be time and fuel consuming to heat adequately. Boiling and roasting are both efficient, easy cooking methods that are well suited to your desert island situation. If you're looking to return to normal life, a smoke signal is one of the best ways to be discovered. Indeed, once you have established a survival routine, setting a smoke signal should be your next priority. Three fires burning at once is a universal signal for distress. So, build three signal fires if you have the resources and energy to do so. Even if you can't keep all of these lit 24-7, you can create fire pits that are easy to get started when you are able. Cover these pits and protect them from the elements when they are not in use. Keep plenty of tinder in or around the fire, or fires, even when they are not lit, so the fire can be ignited very quickly. If you see a ship approaching on the horizon, you need to be able to make your signal fire immediately. Green, leafy vegetation will create highly visible white smoke, but it will burn quickly. Build your signal fire just like you would your cooking fire. Tinder, then kindling, then large pieces of slow burning wood. But top your signal fire with a consistent supply of young green vegetation. Again, three fires is best, but one signal fire is a whole lot better than none. You will notice that many, almost all, of these survival techniques require some type of tool. 
A knife is the most important of them, but you will also need a fishing implement as well as some cordage at a bare minimum. Luckily, all of these things are very easy to make with resources you have at your disposal. A knife is simply essential for surviving on your desert island. You will need two stones, a hammer stone and a stone to turn into your knife or knives. The hammer stone should be large and rounded. Use a more angular and jagged rock for fashioning your blades. Place the jagged rock on your leg and glance the edge of it with your hammer stone. Eventually, shards of the smaller rock will break off. These will probably be plenty sharp to use as knives, though they can be sharpened by dragging the blade at a 45 degree angle across a larger, smooth stone. In the tropics there will be plenty of fish well within wading or swimming distance of the beach. The vast majority of them are perfectly edible in a survival situation. But fish often congregate in spots that are the most comfortable and offer the most opportunities for shelter. Areas around reefs, rocks, or other underwater structures provide a great place to look for fish and marine life. There are a lot of ways to catch fish, but they all require some type of fishing implement. The three methods we are discussing will be spear fishing, line fishing, and trapping. These are all great options for your desert island, but each has its own potential drawbacks as well. Spear fishing is probably the first method that comes to mind in a desert island scenario. All you need, after all, is a spear, but be forewarned. Spear fishing has a significant learning curve. Most fish are going to be pretty difficult to spear, some more so than others, and you will likely not experience immediate success. To build a spear, sharpen a long stick. Bamboo will work well. That's really it. If you can use cordage to attach multiple points to the spear, that's even better. This will allow you to cover more water area with each thrust, increasing your chance of success. And as you find a fish, be sure to account for refraction. Aim a little bit below where the fish appears to be in the water. Again, keep in mind that this is a difficult skill to learn and you will experience failure before success. But once you learn how to spear fish, it's a really effective way to harvest seafood. Angling is another option. This is a more passive way to fish that requires less effort, but more time and more materials. A fishing rig is built from a stick, cordage, a buoyant piece of wood, a small stone, a hook, and bait of some kind. Some of these items are optional. You don't need a pole. It is perfectly acceptable to fish with a hand line just by tossing your cordage into the water. But a pole will make it easier to cast and easier to set lines into the water for overnight use. Your island will also have plenty of bamboo, so a pole is generally recommended. It is possible to improvise a hook from a thorny plant or several thorny stems tied together. You can fish without a hook. Some species swallow food without chewing, and the end of your line will simply get caught in its stomach. Ideally, you would also find some kind of bait. Insects, worms, and berries work well in place of live fish. However, you can carve a fish out of three pieces of soft wood tied together with cordage. The more lifelike you can make this fake bait, the better. Once all your supplies are assembled, tie the cordage to your pole. About 75% of the way down your line, tie the floating wood. Then tie your rock or anything else that sinks towards the end of the line and the improvised hook at the very end if you are using one. It is a good idea to fashion many of these rigs to use at the same time in various spots around your island. Many fish feed most actively at dusk and dawn. Set your line or lines out a safe distance from the tide just before sunset and check them before and after first light. If a storm is coming, the rain hitting the surface will often scare fish away, so don't bother fishing during or immediately after a storm. Do not fish in the same way you would at home, that is to say, avoid sitting for hours with your fishing pole. Fishing is just not as good during the day, and you want to avoid unnecessary sun exposure whenever possible. You could also make a fish trap. This is difficult and time consuming, but can be a really effective way to catch fish, crabs, and any number of other food sources. A trap also does not require bait, though it would be helpful. A fish trap is usually made with an entrance that starts wide from the outside, but narrows as it lets species into the trap. So, fish can get in, but they can't get out. These can be fashioned out of bamboo in many different shapes. There are no specific models or plans for these types of traps, but here are two examples that can be made using bamboo and cordage. 
put these traps in the water wherever fish may congregate and swim. Check them regularly. Cordage is immensely helpful in building the things that you need to survive. You can make cordage out of any fibrous plant by stripping away long, thin pieces of bark. Tie or weave these together to lengthen and or strengthen your line. You could also use a strip of your clothing, but clothes offer much needed protection from the sun and should not be sacrificed unless absolutely necessary. With these tips, you can survive pretty much indefinitely. But it's important to accept this. You aren't getting yourself off the island. You could be rescued by a passing ship or an airplane overhead, but you're just not gonna get yourself off the island. It's just not happening. If you make a raft and hit the open ocean, you will die. You may run out of resources because a raft can only carry so much stuff or more likely your raft will be ripped to pieces by the open ocean and you will drown. If you're on a desert island, stay there. Because the island has all the resources you could possibly need until someone rescues you, which will probably happen eventually. Surviving may not be easy, but it is absolutely 100% possible.